Greetings, I welcome you to our worship service here at Bethel United Church of Christ in Evansville, Indiana. I'm Reverend Samuel Buer, and I'm pleased to say that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, here in this place where we strive to be united in seeking God's will and in serving all people. So again, we welcome all of you who are gathered with us in person, as well as those that are joining with us online uh, this morning. If you're new to us, every month we identify one mission partner that we want to focus on. And for the month of January, if you, had walk, if you walked in this morning and you saw a table back there with a bucket on it and all kinds of cleaning supplies, uh, we're working with Church World Service, also with our Indiana Kentucky Conference United Church of Christ Disaster Response Team. And we're hoping to collect about 10 buckets or more uh, to put together. Uh, and so you'll see back there, there's also in the bulletin, um, uh, all, the, all the things that are needed. So we're looking for donations of supplies and or money. Uh, and so that our goal again is 10 or more uh, flood kits uh, that we'll be putting together sometime in February. Also, we have a, uh, there's in the bulletin, there's a Christmas Eve poll. Uh, this past year, we moved to, uh, at your urgings, we moved to an afternoon time on Christmas Eve, and it worked so well. well now we thought we'd pull one more time, and the offering was, uh, the question was, do we want to, worship committee said, do we want to have it at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock? And so there's a poll in there. Uh, be sure to fill those out and get those in. Congregational meeting coming up, and we're doing a couple of things. It's next Sunday, election of officers, uh, approval of the budget, and a bylaw proposal. There's a me we're going to have a meal with that, but also a vision discussion. And so we're hoping to move rather quickly through uh, the, the, the business of that day. In fact, we'll probably do that during the meal time so that we can spend about an hour. We hope to be right at an hour on the vision process, and we'd really like to have as many participating in that as possible. And I'm going to invite Joan English to come up and to speak a little bit about that. I was given two minutes. I think I can keep it to four. The last few weeks, the Convergence or Visioning team have presented the lack of affordable housing, violence, food shortages, and better support of our Bethel Buddies and Stockwell families as the four main issues facing our community that we wish you to consider. We have been told that to tackle our goals, we need to be open to change. 
As a part of this process, we were tasked with interviewing people from our community. The interviews I did definitely changed me. Within the first five to 10 minutes of asking Catherine Martin, Knight Township Assessor, what brought her to her position, I was hearing the story of the 2005 tornado that destroyed the East Park mobile home neighborhood in Evansville. Her little son CJ, her mother-in-law, her grandmother-in-law, three of the 25 that were killed. The firefighters found them and brought them home. The firefighters became Catherine's heroes that day. In 2009, there were financial troubles with the Knight Township Assessor's Office and talk of shutting down the fire department. She ran for office with firefighters knocking on doors campaigning for her, and in 2010, she won by two votes out of 18,000. The first thing she had to do when she got into office was shut down the fire department due to lack of absolutely no funds available. Many of you have already heard about a portion of my interview with Denise Carter, the preschool director, in which I found out we have preschoolers and their families on the state voucher program that are dealing with food insecurity. We put them on a list along with some Stockwell families to receive Thanksgiving food baskets. When they received your support to buy, we then received your support to buy Christmas gifts for Bethel Buddy families, and we very much appreciate the generosity. You know, it's one thing to talk about food insecurities and supply a few meals at the holidays, but honestly, I greatly dislike the term food insecurities. It sounds so clinical and distant. We're not talking about people who don't have the ability to make a decision on trying new food. We talk about the people who have no food to try. When I asked Denise what she would dream of for our community, she quickly responded to see people, really see the people. When you say food insecurity, I see a little preschooler's face that I was reading a silly story to while not aware of her growling belly. People are hungry year-round every day. People walking our halls, people that live in our neighborhood. People who are trying, but able, unable to keep up with the cost of their family's basic needs. People who need to be seen. Many weeks ago, I started putting food on a cart in our hallway with the sign, need one, take one. I've been trying to keep it full, but within a couple of days of refilling it, it's usually mostly depleted. People who are going hungry aren't likely to have much money for gas if they are lucky enough to have a car that would get them to a food bank or free meals. So I've been trying to band-aid the problem with what I'm calling Pat's Pantry, named after my mother, Pat Perigo. The irony still gets me. In the middle of fast foods and grocery stores, on every corner there are hungry people. According to online statistics, 20% of Evansville is dealing with food insecurities. That's one in five people. One in five people are hungry. Do you see them? Bring your ideas, thoughts, and passions to our meeting next Sunday. Again, we hope to see as many of you there next Sunday for that time because we think this will be a very informative as to how we or where we move forward in, in the work of our church. So, thank you, Joan. Let us now worship this day. Let us start this service well by reminding ourselves that it is not we who chose Christ, but Christ who chose us. That we are not here because of our goodness, because of Christ's grace, that we are not here to enlighten ourselves, but to allow Christ to enlighten us, that we have not come to be entertained, but to worship God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. I would invite those who are able to rise as we sing, O Worship the King.
us pray together this morning. Eternal God, the refuge and help of all your children, we praise you for all you have given us, for all you have done for us, for all that you are to us. In our weakness, you are strength. In our darkness, you are light. In our sorrow, you are comfort and peace. We cannot number your blessings. We cannot declare your love. For all your blessings, we bless you. And may we live as in your presence and love the things that you love and serve you in our daily lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you all to be seated. The scriptures for this day are from the book, the old, the Hebrew scriptures of the book of Jonah. And so we've got the service built around that, the sermon, and now a song. Uh, who did? Someone want to come up here by me? Because I'm lonely. I'm lonely up here. I am. Yay! I don't know. Uh, why, don't we just sit, why don't we just sit here? Oh my gosh. Just a moment. Yeah, I have to. Uh, it takes. My name is Rob. What's your name? Sonia. Sophia. Wow, I love that name, Sophia. You're welcome. What? Okay, I, the reason I... She's very beautiful. Just like my puppy dog, who's Sophia also. It's a beautiful name. I like it a lot. Okay, amen. Children's sermon is over. So... <laughs> So, um, I have a question for you, Sonia. Oh, and your name? Oh, I mean, Sophia. Sophia, I should know that. Sophia and Lisa. Uh, yeah. I have a question for both of you. Okay. So, have you ever been told by your loving parents or a loving relative to do something and you didn't want to do it? Boy, you're perfect. I like you. <laughs> Really? You do everything? Oh, that's wonderful. Where are your... <laughs> I, well, I, here, I'll even show you. How old are you, Sophia? Seven? Are you serious? Well, I just have to ha happen to have, so you know that I'm kind of older than you are, aren't I? Okay. So anyway, I want you to know that I was your age at one time. This is me at seven years old. That's me at seven years old. I was actually seven years old, believe it or not. Now, I almost didn't with my parents because I didn't always do what I was supposed to do. But I'm glad, Sophia, you did. Now, Lisa and I, were on the, we were kind of learning how to do that. But if I did something wrong, and I don't know about Lisa, now you're just learning from us, okay, Sophia? Okay. That... If we didn't pay attention to our loving parent doing something, sometimes I had to have time out. Do you know what that is? Like, I had to go to my room. Have you ever had to go to your room because you didn't want to do something? No. -uh. 
Okay. Well, okay, so I was just a bad kid. So anyway, um, I have a story for you. And it has three main characters. Jonah, a big whale, and God. Okay? All right. So God saw a bunch of people not loving God and not loving each other. Does God want us to love each other? Yeah, I agree. Well, God saw all these people, and they weren't doing that. So God called Jonah, said, Jonah, I want you to go over there. And she called them on their cell phone. Uh, God told Jonah to go to those people and tell them to be nice and to love God. You know what, Sophia? Jonah didn't want to do that. So Jonah went the, the, the opposite direction, away from those people. Long story, he, got thrown, he was on a ship, he got thrown in the water, and God felt sorry for him and said, well, you know, Jonah, you need to think about this. So instead of sending Jonah to his room, because you know in the big sea there is no room, no bedroom, but there was a big whale. And so Jonah said to the whale, I want you to swallow Jonah and put him in your stomach. So the whale did that. Now this is a story, mind you. So um, Jonah was in the belly's whale for three days and three nights, and Jonah had to think about what God asked him to do. And what do you think Jonah finally figured out what to do? What do you think? Yep, he had to go back and talk to those people and, and do what God told, her, told him to do. So that's something all of us, even, all, even the little people in all of us, adults, all of us are, are big people, but there's this little person inside of me, this little Robbie Hartman inside of me. Just like, yeah, like everybody else has, little, little, little Lisa inside of her. Little Sophia inside of you. Anyway, we all need to learn to pay attention to what God asks us to do. And one of the biggest things God wants us to do is to help people feel God's love. You know how we do that? How do we do that, Sophia? We think of him? Yes. And when we think of God, what is God, what do you think God wants us to do? What do you think God wants me to do for you? Hmm? You don't know? God wants me to love you and be nice to you. God wants me to love Lisa and be nice to her. And God wants me to be, love all these people and be nice to them. And God wants Sophia to be nice and love people, all these people, even the people outside this church. Okay? All right, let's pray. Oh, God, help us to be nice to other people and to love you always. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Sophia. All right. Our president covers lots of bases, so Lisa's doing uh, the learning centers and has asked me to read the story that you just heard, so a little bit more uh, specificity here. The story of Jonah is the story of the prophet sent to the Assyrians, as Rob has told us, in Nineveh. They were the enemies of the Israelites. And those who heard the story that we are about to share knew that both Nineveh and Jerusalem had been destroyed. The story, as Rob said, is a story, and it's satire, uh, leading one literal interpreter who's a friend of mine, he interprets the Bible very literally, he said if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the whale, he'd believe it. Well, we are not quite that literalistic around here, but I think we'll find the satire in the story. There are a number of ways to interpret it, and I'm looking forward to hearing how Sam's going to help us do that. Bottom line is, God's heart wins over God's justice if you have to have one of the two. From Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. 
But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea with such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship was threatened to break up. Then the sailors were afraid and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, what are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will spare us the thought so that we do not perish. And the sailors said to one another, come, let us cast lots so that we might know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? Well, I'm a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, what is this that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them so. And then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it's because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is a part of our sacred story. Thank you for that reading, Stephanie. Let us bow our heads now for a moment as we prepare to hear this word preached this day. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight, O Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. microphone on there. If you're new to us, you might not know that every once in a while, maybe about once a month or not quite that often, I'll pull out that rocking chair and I'll do a sermon from the rocking chair. It takes on a different tone when I do that, I found. And when I do it, I, it's, I feel like I'm inviting you to my front porch to share a bit of something I've learned. So I'm going to invite you to my front porch this morning to share with you something that I've learned about this story. The story of Jonah. I can remember it, hearing it in my youth. It's a kind of a fun story for kids when it's told in different ways. But it's really not a children's story. There's a great truth in this story that crosses time and imagination. I learned a great deal about this story when I was reading some time ago from Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell wrote a book called A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Joseph Campbell was a renowned scholar in the 20th century, a renowned scholar on mythology, on mythology. And I didn't know a lot about mythology at the time. But what I learned from him is that oftentimes, if I were to use the word myth, 
What do you think of? Most people think when you say the word myth, it's something that's not true. It's false. That's a myth. That's one definition. But there's another definition that's absolutely the opposite of that, and that's a definition that Joseph Campbell uses. When he speaks about myth, he speaks about some of the greatest truths there ever are. I would use the words, as we speak about this myth, especially among others, that myths are more real than maybe even you and me. They drive, they get at the greater truths. And there's a real great truth around this story, around this myth. In fact, so, there's such, there's such a great truth to it that in that book, A Hero with a Thousand Faces, Campbell tells stories, similar stories to this Jonah one. He said there's a story from the Eskimos of the Bering Strait. Those Eskimos of the Bering Strait did not know any of the Hebrews that wrote this story. Those Eskimos tell the story of a trickster hero called Raven. The story goes that one day as Raven was drying his clothes on the beach, he observed a whale cow swimming gravely close to the shore. And he called out to that whale cow, next time you come up for air, dear, open your mouth and shut your eyes. And the whale dove and Raven quickly put on his raven clothes and pulled out his raven mask and he grabbed some fire sticks under his arm and he flew out over the water. And when the whale came up, she did just as she was told. And when she opened her mouth and closed her eyes, the raven darted in those open past those open jaw, straight into, her, straight into her gullet. And the shocked whale cow snapped and sounded. A raven stood inside and looked around. Story of Raven story of Jonah. Well, there's another story. The Zulus of South Africa, who again, didn't know the Hebrews and didn't know the Eskimos, have a story of two children and their mother who were swallowed by an elephant. And when the woman reached into the, when she got into the animal's stomach, she saw large forests and great rivers and many high lands. And on one side, there were many rocks and there were many people who had built their homes there. There were dogs, there were cattle, all of this inside the elephant. Another story, another myth. Do you remember the story of Little Red Riding Hood? Swallowed by a wolf? The Native Americans of the Blackfeet tribe of Montana have a story, a swallowing story. There's another story from the Sumerians of the ancient Middle East. There's one from Ireland, Finn McCool, swallowed by a monster. The Polynesians tell of Maui, swallowed by a great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother. And then there's the Greek pantheon, where all but Zeus was swallowed by Kronos. Then even in our time, in pop culture, Walt Disney, there's a movie, Pinocchio. All getting at this deeper myth, this great truth. Now here's where it goes. Campbell says when you're swallowed, being swallowed or entering into the belly of the whale. So he uses the term into the belly of the whale. Now, like Stephanie, he's not a literalist. For him, it's myth, great truth. It's a metaphorical image. When you enter the belly of the whale, you're embarking on a journey where one has to answer a call to adventure and more often than not, defeat all kinds of obstacles that have been put there by guardians of that threshold. 
Campbell compares entering the belly of the whale akin to dying or to dying to oneself. In my youth, Star Wars came out. It wasn't until years later, I went to a, we were in Toledo at an art museum and there were all kinds of pieces from, models from Star Wars that were on display there. And I learned that George Lucas, the director, had taken Joseph, Joseph Campbell's mythology and created a movie around it. And so when that tractor beam from that Death Star pulled Luke Skywalker in, Luke Skywalker was crossing the threshold and entering the belly of the whale. All kinds of things and obstacles were in his way. He calls, Campbell calls Jonah a reluctant hero who didn't want any part of that ordeal. Luke Skywalker didn't want a part of that, but was chosen. And here's where it becomes real. Here's where the, the truth really becomes real for all of us. At some point, we're all going to cross that threshold, whether we want to or not. And there's going to be obstacles there. Some 30 years ago, we were looking forward to the birth of our second child. We had a name chosen, Peter. Peter came way too early didn't have the medical science yet to keep him alive. Alan and I were cast into the belly of the whale, not by choice, but we had some obstacles to get through. That was one time for me. I've walked with a number of folks who've been diagnosed with cancer Talk about a belly of the whale. Or if you've lost a spouse, you've entered the belly of the whale. Not by choice. But clearly you're going to have to die to yourself and you're going to be a new person sometime in the future. Campbell also used the word tomb for that belly of the whale. Again, a place of rebirth. It's interesting that the early Christian church, for the first couple centuries, the image that they used more often than not for Christianity was a fish. The cross was not the prominent symbol until many centuries later. Because they understood that Jesus had died and entered that belly of the whale, had entered the tomb. In that three days and three nights, you notice Jonah, how many days and nights? There's a tradition that it's old Jewish Hebrew tradition that when somebody died, their spirit stayed with them for two days. And it wasn't until the third day that the spirit left. That's the three days, dying to oneself and coming anew. Again, the church claimed that story. Jesus being resurrected on that third day, coming out of the whale, and came with a new message. Because when you live through it, you gain some insights. And he came back and said, never again will evil win. 
It appears to win, but the message of the gospel is that evil will not win. And it's love that wins. It's love that's going to make this world go round. I'd love to tell that message to a bunch of leaders right now in the Middle East who don't get it. Campbell goes on. He says, it's not just the big times on the belly of the whale. He also talked about sanctuary doors. Have you ever been to Europe to some of the big cathedrals there? If you look on those cathedrals, there's all kinds of gargoyles and dragons and all kinds of beasts and things up high usually and some by the doors of the, sanctu- of, of the entrances. You ever seen those? They're there for a reason. They're trying to ward to scare us off from entering. They're like the teeth of the whale. You've got to get past them for this wonderful thing, this change to happen. So we compared, and you know, I didn't think about it this morning when I walked in the doors over here. There's no gargoyles there. But essentially he says, every time you enter these sanctuaries, you're entering the belly of the whale. And you're going to be possibly changed by what happens in this sacred space. If you're willing to die to yourself and to be made new in this time. The irony, or the sad thing is, if that doesn't happen, if you're not changed by, the time, by what's happening in this space, in this sacred spot, it's like being a tourist. You just came in and came and went. I've done that a lot in some of the cathedrals of Europe. I just came in, I was a tourist, and I wasn't changed. But every once in a while, I am. And every once in a while, I become aware of God's spirit and God's call. And I die to myself. And I become anew. That's what this worship, this time is all about. There's more things going on here than many of us realize. But you've got to be willing to enter the belly of the whale. And that's tough. It can be scary to let go of what you know. It's a true story. It's our story. It's a story God wishes for all of us. Amen. Amen. I'd invite now those who are able to rise as we sing, O God, in a mysterious way.
I invite you all to be seated. We turn now to a time of prayer and let us remember those that we named beforehand as well as our own prayers that we offer up when we come to that time of silence. Let's join now. Oh, deep mystery, vital center of our lives, we know your presence is not called up by much speaking. Rather, we may honor your presence in the absence of noise, in the promise of the morning the dancing brightness of the sun. We are struck in awe before the great mystery of the cosmos. We are powerfully moved by a deep concern for our world and our care for one another. May ours be a faith that is more than words and ideals. May ours be a faith of vitality and compassion. Let's be in a time of silence. We lament that there are many people in the world who are burdened by hunger and pain, by sorrow and and anxiety, by violence and loss. May they find comfort and peace, and may their burdens be lifted from them by our actions as peacemakers and doers of justice. Let's be in silence. May we find it in ourselves today to work toward a better world. May we make use of that energy to take part in the lifting of burdens. May our gratitude find expression in the care of others, both near and far. And may we find ways to live and grow on the margins. May we live behind us a trail of encouragement and hope And having spoken much, perhaps too much, now without a word, we rest in your eternal presence. This is our prayer. Let's be at a time of silence. And now let us join together in the prayer that our Savior has taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite those who are able to rise as we sing, O Lord, the Lord is God.
us join now in a prayer as we dedicate the gifts of our time and our talents and our treasures to the work of this beloved community. Let's pray together. Great God of heaven and earth, you call us to leave behind our preoccupations and to follow you into the future. Sometimes we find your call challenging. We are comfortable, maybe even complacent in our presence. May this act of giving be a gesture of our willingness to follow where you lead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now as we come to the close of this time of worship, we have been illumined by sacred stories, by the faithful witness of this community, and by the abiding love of God. We will share this light with the world. And may God's presence, Christ's enduring grace, and the Spirit's power go with us. Amen. This service has ended. Your service now begins. Know that the Spirit of God is with you, whatever comes your way. Amen.